great food and fun for a wonderful weekend getaway coming up right after this. I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to Garden to Table. Hey, today's show is all about weekend getaways. Who doesn't love them? A little R&R, &R, doing something completely different, maybe being out in nature, sitting by the water, you name it, whatever turns you on. Now I'm setting up for a wonderful, easy picnic. We'll get to that a little later in the show. But you know, the thing to think about here is that whatever you do, you need to have some great food to go along with it. And it doesn't take a lot of time. It really should be easy. In today's show, I'll introduce you to a couple of places in Chicago where food and fun go hand in hand. Plus, we'll visit a garden in Kansas City where volunteers have come together to raise a ton of fresh produce for the community. I love picnics, and I'm sure you do too. On a beautiful day like this, why not? When I prepare for a picnic, there are a few things that I keep in mind. For instance, I like to use an insect repellent and spray the ground first. Secondly, I use a piece of cloth or a blanket to set things on. I like to really cut down on waste. For instance, take this old picnic hamper that I found at a secondhand store. It's come in handy many, many times. In it, rather than bringing paper plates and paper towels, I've got a few linen napkins, and rather than having plates, I actually like to take fruit jars like this. Chicken salad, pasta salad, and hey, what about some fresh fruit, fruit salad? So here you have all the makings of a very simple picnic. And by storing them in these fruit jars, well, it makes it really easy. Of course, you gotta throw in something to drink. So I've got some bottled water and some flatware. I don't wanna use the disposable, so I bring some from home. I can clean it up later. You know, I keep a cooler in the car to store this until I find my perfect picnic spot. And you can also use some of those little ice packs to keep things chilled if it's gonna be a little while before you eat. And also, when it comes to bread, I take a basket and then just take some foil and wrap up English muffins, biscuits, whatever I might want to serve with this. This keeps them from drying out or from getting soggy. Of course, the thing that makes this so easy is that you can prepare individual servings for everyone who's going to be at your picnic. And what a great way and an easy way to be outdoors and enjoy nature. If you're looking for something really fun to do on a weekend, think about enrolling in a cooking class or even a cooking school. I'm here in Chicago at the largest cooking school called The Chopping Block. It's a lot of fun. I'm here to demo a couple of really simple yet tasty recipes. Then I'm gonna turn it over to the chefs and they're using some of the best, freshest ingredients. What? could be better than for us all to get together as friends and have a meal together and it have come out of the garden. Skin of the orange, drop it in there. I love to take um, you know, bond in front of our You know, joining a cooking class isn't just about getting together and making someone's recipes. It's a great way to spend time with a loved one or a friend and the perfect way to check out all the local culture and meet some new people. You can actually learn techniques that are helpful in the kitchen. Plus you won't have to purchase any ingredients or clean up the dishes and that's always a plus. And my favorite part is getting to taste all that delicious food. Well that was certainly a lot of fun. So why don't we check in with Chef Walton over at the Market House. He's got some great things cooking up over there. <music> Chef Scott Walton knows how important it is to be aware of where your food comes from by purchasing fresh meat and produce locally, even growing some of his own. Scott demonstrates how to make this delicious recipe with locally raised chicken and fresh vegetables straight from his own rooftop garden. The, the key in getting that crispy skin, besides the honey cayenne mop doing its, its job in crisping up the skin, is to air dry the chicken. It has to be air dried. 
It's the only way to take that moisture between the skin or the flesh of the protein out of the bird, and that's going to allow you to get that crispiness when it hits that grill. Obviously, buying a really, really, you know, nice piece of chicken, you know, hormone and enzyme-free. So we do a half chicken. So what we've done is left the wing joint under the breast, and we've deboned the thigh completely in this chicken. We're going to do a quick little season. A little Allen cracked pepper, both sides of cracked pepper for Allen. We're just gonna do a little touch of olive oil on both sides. Skin side down. We'll let this go for two to three minutes on the front side just to get a nice char on it. We'll just get a nice little mark and a sear on the bottom side of the flesh skin, not overly on the flesh side, because I don't want to dry out that protein. Then we're gonna go into the pan, the honey and the, the, the chicken consomme or chicken stock or veg stock, whatever you choose to use, is actually gonna naturally baste inside the, the pan in the oven. It's, it's a very simple mop. It's four spices, lemon juice, and honey. But I think the, the technique is, is the most important part of, of this whole chicken dish, is toasting those spices. So in a pretty hot pan over medium-high heat, we're gonna start toasting these seeds. What this is gonna do is actually bring out the essential oils. This is about a half a cup of coriander seed. Right here we have about a quarter cup of cumin seed. And once you, you, you'll be able to smell it, and you can hear it a little bit, the oil's starting to come out and toast up again. What it's doing is we're releasing those essential, essential oils in the pan, which is gonna start perfuming the, the, the honey cayenne mop. This is gonna take 30 to 40 seconds. Now you're really starting to get that smell coming off of it. Once you get that smell, you're gonna add your dried spices, which is the cayenne and the paprika. Even though these are dried as well, all herbs and spices that are dried have essential oils in them. And, and the perfume of the, of the, the spices just, it just lights up the kitchen. I mean, and you really, the, the nose will tell you when, when the spices are toasted. And that's it, once you get the nose and the perfume off of it, you wanna shut it down. What we're gonna do, Everybody probably knows what this is, is your coffee grinder. We actually in the restaurant use this as a spice grinder. Quick little tip, give it a little shake. Takes all the heavy from the top, puts it on the bottom, get it mixed, blended real well. We want a fine grind on this actually. Going in with one cup of Meyer lemon juice, one quart of Indiana honey. That's where I'm from, that's why it's Indiana, honey. A couple pinches of kosher salt, a little cracked pepper. I know Alan loves his cracked peppercorn. And then we're just gonna whisk this together. And just be careful, because the honey's a little thick, it's a little messy, but slowly the lemon juice is gonna thin it out a little bit. Give it a little quick taste, make sure we're seasoned right. Oh, money, spot on. We'll get a little of our honey cayenne mop in our pan. There's just a little clarified chicken stock in there. So we'll go in our pan, just put a little bit of fresh parsley in it, and let's go to the oven with it. Home oven, I would say, you know, 400, 425, quick tip. The sugars are gonna caramelize rather quickly. They're gonna kind of foam up and go around the chicken. So if you're worried about your oven or your stove at home, put a pan underneath this pan. So if there's any boil over, it's not gonna burn on the bottom of your stove. You have this really, really rich and crispy chicken with, with all those really intense spices. You need something to cut through that. So just a nice little bistro salad, if you, have some, if you can get some fresh arugula at your market or your farmer's market, and then maybe just a little fresh lemon vinaigrette to finish it off. We serve ours with a little candy lemon to give it another note, a little bitterness out of the lemon, a few local potatoes, and that's it. Now, I know this may look catastrophic, but actually what's going on here is exactly what I want to have happen. These are potato vines, and about a hundred and some odd days ago, we planted potatoes here of a particular variety, and I'll get to that in just a moment. But what the vines are doing now is they're dying back, and that's the indication that it's time to come out here and dig potatoes. And it's like digging up buried treasure, because what you do is you just fold back this dry soil like that, and you can see these beautiful potatoes hanging onto the roots. Look at that. 
just gorgeous. And I love these little tiny ones like this. They're excellent for boiling. This variety of potato is called a Kennebec. Growing Kennebec potatoes has been a tradition in our family since the 1940s. And you know what? Currently, there's a real craze for them among foodies and chefs. And for good reason, it's a great potato. Just look at the yield on these. Look at this clump here. Probably seven or eight potatoes of this size. The skin is very thin on them, so you wanna be careful when you harvest them. I don't like to use a shovel. I like to use a fork like this because you're reducing the chance of actually piercing the potatoes. Any of these potatoes that I pierce, those are the first ones that go into the kitchen for us to use. Look at that. Bingo, solid gold. You can see that the soil is really dry, which is what you want. You don't want to dig potatoes when the soil is wet because it'll just enhance the chance of them rotting. So what I like to do this time of year is come out here and just gather up a few at a time until we're ready to harvest them. What's amazing to me about potatoes is that you can start with just a piece of a potato. I bought 50 pounds of seed potatoes and took them and cut them up so that there was an individual eye on each piece. What I'm trying to do is get into the base here and see if I can find that original piece of potato. There it is right there. So there was a single eye and that eye grew out and made this sprout here, you can see. And under it, over the course of the 100 or so days, so this was in the ground, these potatoes began to grow. Now what you don't want to do is leave the potatoes in the ground too long or they'll begin to rot. This is a rotten potato. It's soft, it's squishy, and it smells really nasty. You don't want to harvest potatoes and put them together with potatoes that have a piece of rot on them or any kind of damage because one rotten potato will cause all of them to rot. If you've never grown potatoes, you should give them a try. And I would recommend that you try these Kennebecs. They're really delicious. All you have to do is boil them and just serve them with a little butter, salt, and pepper. They're out of this world. The way to keep potatoes for a long time is to keep them underground. Let me show you what I'm doing here. Since we have a tall crawl space underneath the house here, I thought let's put it to good use. The temperature in here is at least 20 degrees cooler than it is outside. And what we did is we suspended a rack of shelves from the floor joists here down. You see there are two of these. We use scrap lumber and you can see that it doesn't actually hit the ground. So whatever we put on here is actually elevated, which is really good. And I wanted it not so deep that you couldn't reach across and check things like, for instance, these potatoes. We had a bumper crop of potatoes this year. These are all of those lovely Kennebecs that we grew. And you can't buy these in the grocery store. And so I like to produce them each year. And the way to keep them fresh is you want to separate them and not stack them on top of one another. The other thing you want to do is you want to make sure that if any of them are damaged, that they get pulled out first. So if there's a cut or a bruise on one, you want to eat those first. If any of them begin to rot, and I'm not seeing any rotten ones yet, although this could become a rotted place, although it is actually healing. This would be a potato, for instance, I would eat first. Um, you wanna make sure that you don't have any light on them because they'll begin to turn green and you shouldn't eat green potatoes uh, because green potatoes actually build up a, a toxin in them, which is poisonous. Um, now the main thing I need to do here is come through here every once in a while and check on these potatoes and make sure that there aren't any rotten ones. Uh, the way the shelf is designed, it's designed for plenty of air circulation. So that's why we have these slats between the potatoes here, so the air can circulate through them. I can put potatoes in here, all kinds of canned goods. By keeping potatoes in a cool, dry place like this, they'll last for a long time. If we begin to get any decay or rot uh, to avoid any aroma, because a rotted potato does not smell very good, you can apply lime on them and that will cut down on decomposition and certainly any odor. Ideally, in a cellar like this, is that you'd be able to keep potatoes, whether they're Irish potatoes like these, or sweet potatoes, or other root vegetables, you should be able to keep them well through the winter into early spring until the garden begins producing lots of fresh vegetables. Pretty good idea, huh? Getting involved in a community project is not only a way to help out your neighbors, it's also a lot of fun. Community gardens are really popping up everywhere, and Kansas City has one right in the heart of their art district. Kathy Pemberton tells us a lot more. 
my gosh, look at all of these peppers. Just amazing, what, what variety is this? This is Flamingo, it's like a big version of a Gypsy Bell. Look at that, a sweet pepper. It is a very sweet pepper and I think a somewhat thick wall. Mm-hmm, great for grilling. So Kathy, how much produce do you think you're going to generate out of this garden here in Kansas City this year? Well, from this location, last year we did about 5,700 pounds, just a little short of three tons. Really? That was the whole year. <laughs> yeah. So right now, that's approximately where we are at the end of, through the end of August. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, there's still a lot of produce to go. I hope. Yeah. I hope there's it's amazing. A lot. another ton, literally. <laughs> <laughs> I think there probably will be. You've got sweet potatoes, you've got lots of tomatoes left, eggplant, all kinds of things. How many raised beds are a part of this community garden? I think there's about a hundred. Then there's the containers up there and um, a small in-ground area. You know, it's, it's really inspiring and heartening to see these community gardens popping up all over the country. And they have different designs and so forth, but I'm always fascinated how the logistics works, how you get volunteers out. You have a volunteer base here, I assume. We have a volunteer base. We have volunteers from our company, and then there are six other companies and organizations that have sent volunteer teams in. Really? To six the others? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's terrific. So that, that would be a total of roughly how many people per gardening year? Probably, I would say, roughly maybe 100 people. 100. And that's adequate to keep up with everything that you're doing here. I think so. Yeah. I think it is. Right. Yeah. Now your role here is, is officially what? It's a garden coordinator, so I manage the agricultural portion of this. Right. And that's designing the uh, crop rotation plans and picking the varieties and okay. that sort of thing. So among the tomatoes, what would be one of your favorite varieties this year? Because I assume you are trialing all the time. We are. Um, in our production area, we try and stick with some of the hybrids that we just absolutely know are going to produce for us. Yeah, yeah. But for what you said, the experimental ones, uh, where we really have some fun, and Orange Peruche was a new one for us this year, a small cherry. Oh, it's a charmer and delicious. It is, and very prolific. It yeah. was one of the healthiest uh, tomatoes we, we put in. With all of this produce, what do you do with it? Where does it go? It goes to our local uh, food bank, and they serve um, literally hundreds of agencies in, in a multi-county uh, area on both uh, Kansas and Missouri. Heavens. Well, they have to look forward to seeing all of this gorgeous, organically grown <laughs> produce coming their way. I think they are always happy when they get fresh. Mm -hmm. It's hard to believe that just three years ago, this was a vacant, underutilized lot. It really is. It, it took some imagination, but luckily we have lots of people here with imagination. So. <laughs> <laughs> Including yourself. It has, it has to make you feel good to be a part of this. Oh, it's, it is wonderful, Alan. It is truly, it's a privilege, seriously. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. One of the thrilling things for me about growing a few plants in my vegetable garden is the abundance, the amount of vegetables that you can get from just a few plants or a small area. Take for instance, these peppers. These are cayenne peppers. 12 pounds of peppers picked off of eight plants in one picking. It's quite an amazing yield, wouldn't you say? But you know, for me, that's a problem because I'm a guy who doesn't like to waste anything. So what am I gonna do with all of these peppers? Well, I love pepper sauce. And there's so many different recipes out there. But what I wanted to do today is just share a really basic one with you where you can take advantage of these peppers and some of the others that I grew in the garden, make something delicious that you can share with friends and you can enjoy the flavor throughout the entire year. All right, to get started, it's really simple. You just wanna make sure that your jars and closures are, are clean. What I mean by a closure, that would be the ring and the lid that goes on top of these canning jars. Next, place a rack in the bottom of a boiling water canner and set your jars on top of that. Then add water to the jars until the jars are two thirds full. And add water to the canner. And then you wanna heat this to 180 degrees Fahrenheit but you don't want it to boil. You see what you're doing here is you're just sterilizing the jars. Now you're gonna to wanna to do the same thing with the lids and the rings. So place them in a saucepan and cover them with water and heat them to 180 degrees. Now through this process, you just wanna keep the lids and the jars hot until you're ready to use them. Now for the fun part, the recipe. 
Now you can be creative with this, but I want to share this recipe with you because it really works. And it's because I have these certain peppers in my garden. But just remember, you can come up with any kind of ratio you like. It depends on how much heat you like with your pepper sauce. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking some cayenne peppers. Here they are. You can see we have lots of them. And I have a generous two cup portion here. And I've just coarsely chopped these, almost just cut them in half. And then this is the hot cherry pepper. You can see those here, beautiful. I've got three cups of those. And then this is the mildest of the peppers. This is a banana pepper, and I have six cups of banana peppers. So you can see the colors here are really quite beautiful. Now the other part of this recipe is the solution, the vinegar solution that you pour over them. You see, I use six cups of vinegar, two cups of water, and three cloves of crushed garlic. You see, what happens is the garlic infuses into this water and vinegar solution. It gives it a nice little touch. And then what we're going to do is we're going to pour that over these peppers and fill up the jars. So you'll see in here that it's really hot and steamy, just the way it's supposed to be. And what I'll do is I'll take these jars out one at a time, this handy jar holder. Be careful because it's really hot. You just want to pour the water out of them and then place them over here like this, one at a time. All right, there's the last jar, okay? Now, what we want to do is we want to take these peppers and pack them in. And um, if you want to, when you're working with peppers, you can use uh, these gloves. It's handy uh, because they're really hot and you don't want to rub your eyes. At this point, I'll handle them because it's just easier. But what I'm going to do is just add a few the cayenne. And basically, what you're trying to do is pack them in, pack as many of them in as you can. I like to distribute them equally. Okay, and we'll save a few for maybe the top. Now I'm gonna add some of these beautiful banana peppers. And I'm gonna cap it with some of these hot cherry peppers. Got a few cayenne left here to go on the top. And then you can take a little spatula and just push them down. All right, now I've packed them down. Now it's just a matter of pouring the vinegar solution over them. This is a handy little device that helps me guide the vinegar in. And here's our vinegar. And so what you wanna do is I'll just set this aside and then begin to pour it in like that. You wanna bring the vinegar up just about to the top. You wanna to make sure the peppers are completely covered. That's really all there is to that. You wanna just push out as many air bubbles as you can by just taking a plastic spatula like this and push them down. All right, now I'm just gonna use these tongs to lift out the lids and I can place them on there like that. Here's another one. Still pretty hot. You can see on the bottom of these there's a rubber seal and that's what's important here because you want to make sure that that seal is set. So I'm getting them all evened up. Okay, next I have these screw bands that go over the top and you just want to tighten those down just to where it's tight to the touch. You don't want to crank them down too much and this will make sure that you get a nice seal Back in the bath they go. And here's the last one going in. The water's still pretty hot. Now what you wanna do is you want to raise the water level to one inch above the jars, the top of the jars. So I'm getting that water level up. And I'm gonna bring this to a boil. And this needs to boil for 10 minutes. Then I can turn the heat off and I can set the jars out. So here we go. Now, once those have uh, boiled for 10 minutes, you'll bring them out and let them cool for at least five minutes, maybe even longer. I like for them to become completely cooled. Uh, these are some I made earlier in the day and they are cooled. One of the things you can do just to check to make sure that you've got a seal is you can hold it like that and uh, make sure that it's tight and if it doesn't come loose, then you're in good shape. A simple recipe for pickled peppers. Now I'll have pickled peppers to use in, well, all sorts of things throughout the year. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. Just keep in mind that, you know, you don't have to venture very far from home to get a little R&R. &R. Just do a little research and you never know what you'll find just around the corner. Until next time, good eating and good health.
you think the key thing is that motivates your volunteers in this project? Well, one story I've told them um, that I think has, has really inspired them. One day we took in 76 pounds of lettuce to uh, the food bank right. and one of the people who worked there said occasionally she will go and look on the shopping floor to just see what the agencies are liking and what they're picking out. And sure. she said the, um, the 76 pounds was taken in 12 minutes. You're kidding. <laughs> no. They really went for that fresh lettuce. Went for fresh lettuce and she said it was just, you could just tell because it had been in the ground a couple hours before and yeah. then it was right there for them. So. That's marvelous. That's a very inspiring story. And this is quite an inspiring place. And it's only three years old. It is only three years old. This is our third uh, season.